गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग टू यू डॉक्टर सोलाराम गुड मॉर्निंग आर यू एबल टू हियर मी नाउ वी कैन हियर यू वी कैन स्टार्ट ऑफ द डे सेशन परफेक्ट गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन एंड आई होप यू हैड सम फन यस्टरडे आई सो द पिक्चर एंड विश आई वाज देयर विद यू गाइस थैंक यू आई होप फली टुडे इज गोइंग टू बी द लास्ट पार्ट ऑफ आवर लेक्चर एंड वी आर गोइंग टू बी डिस्कसिंग मोर um the maturation and the changes in evalu in evaluation that we do to regular test and finally we're going to talk about diagnosis and some quick um rehab exercise that we would like or uh, uh, attempt to treatment in these cases um just want to make sure that you're able to see my screen are you able to see my screen uh we are able to see you uh, now oh, okay. we can see now we can see now we can see you can see the screen okay perfect okay uh are you able to see the screen uh, we are seeing you oh okay you cannot see my screen interesting let's check one more time after that. we can see the screen now, now. we can see the screen perfect. now perfect yeah perfect so uh, a quick summary why um, the most important group of kids that we need to screen for vestibular assessment are kids with sensory neural hearing loss and um i emphasize on that no matter if they are vertiginous yes or no i would really recommend a quick screening for these children again i re remind you that cochlear implant patient pre and post is it's really almost my 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 point of view would be a mandatory test prior to cochlear implant post cochlear implant in between decisions for a bilateral option the second point i would remind you of is that case history can provide so much information sometimes even more than tests so make sure that you take your time in asking all the right question both the parents and the kids it would really would help you uh, and guide you toward uh, a proper diagnosis um unless needed for documentation bedside testing can provide so much information in case you have to put a record for example in cochlear implant patient or um for insurance purposes etc sometimes bedside testing are more than enough to provide the exact answer for um for kids and in younger children where really documentation is harder bedside testing could be a solution it's a scary experience for the child make sure that you provide information prior to testing to the parents just to prepare them um for testing and try to create a report with the child because you're going to be seeing the child at more than once most probably so elevate this fear for them and try to make it a bit fun if possible um the final point i'm going to mention here is that vestibular rehabilitation is really easy in children they consider it as a game so it's very important uh it's it's a very important to start it early because it's going to change the way they live on daily basis and hopefully take them out of their cocoon and um sometimes their isolation okay so we talked um Uh, we talked on Friday about anatomy, prevalence, and case history. Today, we're going to go through maturation, a bit more evaluation, diagnosis, and management. Why maturation is very important? As I mentioned, um, maturation will affect some of the test results. Uh, three points that we're going to be discussing in detail today: it's the first sensory system to develop, the system is functional at birth, and where the reflexes uh, peaks. So the first sensory system to develop and by this I mean by 10 weeks you're getting the bony vestibule by 10 week the membrane gland labyrinth 20 weeks the, the brain starts marination uh, the brain starts marination and by 32 weeks your vestibular receptor is fully responsive almost around birth your vestibular nerve myelination is happening so in parallel during gestation your other senses are developing as well so when we know that at 49 days the famous 49 days the morphology of the vestibular apparatus is complete around same weeks the sense of touch is going to start 
around 12 to 24 weeks, our neural con connections, especially with the oculomotor nuclei and the brainstem are going to occur. This is around the same time where your sense of taste are going to start building in the sense of hearing. So around 17 weeks is what the uh, literature is trying to tell us, so which the child starts hearing or develops properly. By the 28th weeks, the child is able, to, his um, sense of smell is developed. And around 30 to 40 weeks, as I said, the vestibular nerve is the first cranial nerve to complete myelination and become functional. So we're talking just before birth. The sense of vision continues to uh, develop and it's not completely mature, even at birth. And I really like to show this picture to parents, showing them that the newborns are not able to see properly. And it, is, it isn't around uh, um, until we are around six months that this, it's not as um, clear as uh, adults, but it starts getting shapes. And um, this is very important to keep in mind when you're doing oculomotor testing or you're doing reflexes. So keep that in mind. And this picture helps a lot with parent. You can find it in baby care, uh, which is the website online. Okay. Um, what I want to say here is that the vestibules and the semicircular canal around six months of gestational age are similar to the size of an adult. So again, we're talking morphology, we're there. And however, is it really functional at birth? So the system is it really functional at birth? And we know that the first um, the first six months, not, we're not able to, pr we're, we're able to test the child for sure. But are we really, whatever information we get from the vestibular system, how accurate are they? And in my opinion, they're not accurate. So even if we know we have um, possibility of having a hearing loss and now we diagnose the child with a hearing loss, I would not do any testing before six, the, the, the window period of window will be six to 12 months. And although they were able to perform VHIT on children aged three months and VAMP on younger group, but that would be for me a gray window. Children are starting to learn about gravity and are trying to adapt to it. By the time they stand and walk, they have overcome this and we're sure that the, their muscles have developed properly and the reflexes are trying, are, are being, um, are maturing. So what we can do is uh, what we know, or it's a clear fact that we were able to do the writing by one to two months. We acquire head control, which means you um, you lift the head and the eyes are aligned around two months. Children are uh, learning to sit by six to eight months and they stand and walk between 12 to eight months. And finally, they're able to get more or less adult a vestibular function around 10 to 12 years. And I do not agree always that they reach around 10 to 12 years. I think it's uh, individual specific, but at least the first block, which is th these ones, which is less than uh, two years old, I agree that the stages are more or less providing information that are necessary for us, which is adaptation to gravity, this one. Now, when do they really peak? We know that there, we need to think about two things. Even if the system is fully functional, and by this I mean structurally, it's similar to adult. Um, it seems that the maturation more or less is complete, but we also have input from the brain that com continues to mature till even 18, 19 years old. So I cannot assume, knowing that the vestibular system has a lot of integration at the different cortex, that it's completely uh, and it's, it's not it's completely done as early as 10 to 12 years old as mentioned on friday is, is that um different uh, part of the um, posture imbalance um, mature differently zero to four years old they mainly depend on visual cues and not on their vestibular system five to eight years old they have somatosensory function similar to adult and they have a poor resolution of sensory visual complex. 11 to 12 years old is when you start seeing more of a vestibular component. Their vision, um, their uh, somatosensory is mature. Their vision starts to mature, depending on gender as well. And you see a good component of the vestibular system starting to emerge. 15 to 17 is where you see them 
oh, I would not say mature, I would say almost mature. And um, the vision system in Somatsu Center is completely mature. And we can see this facility integration more on the computerized dynamic posturography and other tests as well. So let's go back to evaluation. Now that we know that maturation is not the same, would evaluation change? And I do some adaptation for these tests and keep that in mind. So we said that the first thing we need to do is case history. Otoscopy is a must, must, must. If you cannot perform otoscopy on a child, postpone the vestibular assessment because otoscopy is going to help a lot of things, especially with calorics. It's going to help you with, um, um, if you cannot do otoscopy, at least do TIMS. Audiological evaluation, TIM, it has a triple function, I call it. It's not only giving you information about the middle ear, but also it will, um, uh, in case you need to do VAMPs in, um, if you have a um, conductant component, that means VAMP cannot be done. And I use it as well as a, a fistula test. And while I'm doing that, while my assistant or my, my, my partner is actually performing them, I'm looking at the eyes using it as a fistula test, making sure that there is no nystagmus. Definitely, um, you can see a facial reaction, but sometimes you really need to see the nystagmus. Even they tell you they're dizzy. A lot of kids are coming to your clinic, they're dizzy. This is the first test you do, they're gonna, um, provide you with wrong information more or less. An audiogram and I do OEs on all the kids. Um, sometimes I have to stop here and reschedule for vestibular assessment. And even if you think this is, um, this is you, you're losing your time by splitting the test on a couple of days, but that would be the best option for the child. Because if your uh, audiological evaluation took one hour and a half, uh, the child is already tired, he's not gonna be able to test, to continue testing with you and be collaborative for the rest of the test. I will always, if I can do this within the audiological evaluation and I feel the child is within um, a good age range, I will put up posturography. It's always fun, it's easy. They can provide further information. So a few um, bedside testing and then I send this child home. I will not do the rest of the test until the next visit if I feel the child is tired. So I start with, I said, vestibular screening, which is a bedside that we discussed last week, uh, on Friday, sorry. Now we're gonna talk about the ocular motor testing. What are the changes we do with children? I'm not gonna talk about the rotary chair because it's very well, um, um, made for pediatric population, no major changes are going to happen. VEMP, VHA, CDP, um, uh, and calorics. These are the tests we're gonna review. And honestly, this is the, the order I use um, for testing my child. So I start with oculomotor testing on the rotary chair or on a different system, depending on the occupancy of the rooms. And then um, I do VEMP and VHIT. CDP, it depends, CDP, it's a floating test, and caloric will be the last test to do. And unless I really need to do calorics, I will not be performing calorics on children. Okay, uh, contraindication, please keep this in mind. In case of cardiac problem, epilepsy, extreme anxiety, panic attacks, um, non-cooperation for testing or autism, tests are not to be performed. Do not even attempt it, it's a personal advice. Uh, epileptic and autism, don't, e don't even try performing the tests. Uh, try to see if you can do bedside testing, but that would be it. I will not go further. And I will write it in my report. Okay, very important. These are my, um, my very important items in the clinic. I need stickers, gifts as stationery, something cheap, etc. Candies and toys um, that I keep in, in bins in my office and so every single test they go through, they get a gift. And usually I mix and match and it, um, it depends on the age. Sometimes you don't have to give so much rewards, but sometimes you do. Otherwise you will not be able to get your evaluation. Um, it could be as a reward at the end or it could be as an incentive at the beginning. So get a lot of stickers, you're gonna need them. Kids love stickers. Okay, so let's talk about oculomotor studies. I'm sure that, um, I saw there was a full workshop about um, saccade and smooth pursuit or motor studies and details. I'm not going to say what we're doing in these tests, or I'm not going to explain further about them, but let me give you tips on when you're performing oculomotor studies in children. 
first of all, if you're capable of it, um, get the pediatric version of it. I'm not sure if all system allows it, but I know that you can upload some, um, you can upload some uh, children friendly pictures into your system. For example, this is for Sakad and you have a birthday for Smooth Pursuit. I've seen cats, etc. So this always helps, especially for younger kids. Instruct, re-instruct, and re-instruct, and re-instruct. You're going to need to re-instruct every single time. Um, make sure that the goggle position positioned is properly put in on the child and every single part of the test because uh, we do some free, we do different frequencies. And it's very important to know that kids tend to remove their goggles. So every single time they remove the goggle, we're going to recalibrate. Adjust to center. Now, in my case, if I'm using the rotary chair, I'm going to put a pillow under the child. But in case I'm using the regular VNG room or we use a table, I'm using an ENT chair that allows me to um, elevate or um, decrease the child base to be really centered in the middle. I've used pillows and I would say that it's a good option or mommy's lap is an even better option for uh, elevation if you, my chair is not moving. Um, Check parameters norms. We're going to talk about norms in a second. And I do really believe that each group should collect their own uh, norms for children because I see it that um, whenever we're having different, a mix of population, the norms are not the same. So we, can, we, we talked about this in one of our studies. I feel like um, it is really mandatory especially in everything related to the eyes, that you have something that you're, every recording that having in through eyes needs a different population. And it's related to the way the goggles sits on the nose. It's the related to many components with these children. Um, another thing that I would say is study the tracing to remove artifacts. You're going to get a lot of artifacts with kids. Study the tracing, do not rely only on the numbers. Okay. So the other thing that you need to keep in mind is that the saccad latency is going to be longer in children and it decreases with age. Velocity is going to be almost the same. Accuracy is, I would not rely at all on um, uh, values that the system would provide me. I would review the tracing for regularity or abnormality that is throughout the tracing, not on one. Because you're going to see hypometria and hypometria in children a lot. So review the tracing one by one. And smooth pursuit, you're going to find a reduced gain. And it's completely normal to find values around 0 0.5, 0 point, uh, less than 0 0.5. I start questioning if, um, and definitely the tracing of the smooth pursuit will provide you further uh, information. Asymmetry in smooth pursuit is possible. I've seen um, asymmetry in normal children. And um, uh, Duarte Lanal and Macassan and their team were saying that this is due to uh, difference in brain maturation right versus left. Uh, with OPK, um, gain definitely will increase with age and asymmetry is increased as well. So this is the same point. Um, I would not record, honestly speaking, I would not record a child's ocular test unless really, really needed under the age of eight years old. Seven to eight years old, I can do that easily. But less than this, I will have to um, think about it. Is it really necessary to record their, um, record their oculomotor yes or no? Now let's talk about VAMP a bit. Uh, VAMP is the next test I usually do. And um, for me, CVAMP can be tested at all ages, it's, uh, starting six months for me. And OVAMP, I will not do it before three to four years old because I need the Do. First of all, we're testing in a supine position. The child is seated and then they have a monitor in their hand or I have a, a toy at the, uh, at, the end of the, um, at the end of the room where they need to focus on the toy. Uh, in cases of younger children, I will use a pillow and will use or the mom's hand to hold the baby's head while we do um, uh, during SIVA. Uh, make sure that you change uh, EMG uh, monitoring and activation um, values on your screen. 
Kids have latencies and amplitude that are affected by age. So do not be surprised on the results you get. And as you can see here, I'm going to show you in a few minutes different studies, and you're going to be surprised. Um, for OVAMP, we're using AC or a bone conductor combined with a special amplifier for higher intensity. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure if um, all labs are able to do uh, BC, but I know the majority is doing AC on OVA. I think both are good enough uh, once the child is cooperating. Start with the, with the bone wire, bone conductor, put it on the child's hand for a few seconds, uh, let him understand what's going to happen, and then perform the test. Do not surprise them at all. Um, make sure you provide for kids that are three to four. Um, even older than this, provide feedback, say they're doing a great job, we're almost done. Throughout testing, this will give them feedback that they're doing a good job. Or if they have to provide feedback, because the child, even if you give them the monitor, they will still need help. Okay, so there are two studies that provide normative data for VAMP. They're almost the same, but giving us a latency that can be um, ranging between two, uh, P1, latency for P1 and CVAMP is around 12 to 18 milliseconds. And I've seen cases as low as eight milliseconds and everything is completely normal. So again, collect your own normative data, things can change. Um, annual latency is between 20 to 26 milliseconds, but I have seen um, kids with younger group where it goes to 15 and you have very nice peak. And, and for me, normal, nothing is, nothing is wrong. So how I do my tests would be a threshold at 90, at 90 and a threshold at 75, if um, at, uh, I do not do more than, um, I do the screening at 90 and screening at 75, and that's it. In case I see something at 75, I would start thinking about the superior canal dehesis. Uh, an asymmetry cutoff would be 35 degrees, sorry, 35%. Um, less than this, I would consider completely normal. Okay. Now let's talk about the V-HIT. We talked about it a bit on Friday, saying that the V-HIT system um, is a goggle-based or a non-goggle-based, and it helps test six canals. Again, my question, my, my personal experience is that I will only rely on um, lateral canals and not, I'm, I don't do vertical canals on young children yet. I do not still see, um, there is a clinical value for sure, but I'm, I'm not, confident enough what are the cutoff for vertical uh, vertical canals in children. Um, when you're doing the tests, I would say 60 to 70% I'm able to get a result, but there is a percentage where I'm not able to get a result. Uh, when using the mask, the care is the mask, and I put here a picture, um, I put here um, an arrow. See what I mean? You're touching you're touching the um, mask or the goggles, and I don't think that's a good idea. So if you're testing, you know, you need to make sure that the goggle is, is here and you're not actually touching the goggle or giving it, um, pre putting pressure on it. Or you can hold the head of the child from above. I don't think you should actually put the mask. Okay, calibration. This can be sometimes very hard for children. Um, some systems don't have calibration, which I think has its positive and negative, but calibration sometimes is the reason why you're not going to be able to get a V-hit because you fail to calibrate simply. Use a toy. You're going to use a toy. I'm not, able, I'm not sure if you're able to see here, but the lady here is holding a toy. You're using a toy here. This is for your focus. This is your focus point. Put a toy, a sticker on the wall. Give them something to um, something to focus on, and uh, with younger kids, uh, toys were not very um, toys were not very uh, helpful. So we started using even, um, and I'm, I'm f we started using more of um, sounds, uh, toys that make sounds, and this at attract their um, attention. Uh, as I mentioned, I st skip vertical till the age of seven years old. And um, although they can perform uh, VHIT in less than six months, I, I don't think that it's a good idea because the, it's not before six months that you have an active head control. 
and which is needed for a reliable measure, measure of uh, v hit. Now, the v hit parameter, the normative data is not the same across systems, so that makes me wonder if we're doing the same movement, and I, I think it's related to recording that it should be, is it, is it really a gain of 0 0.7 or it's less than this? Um, for me, I rely on, I, I see the gain for sure, but I rely on it where I have corrective saccades, yes or no. And this is, this, I have here a study by um, Sylvette Lineva uh, Cher and uh, Paris, um, Robert Debré, which is a very um, big pediatrician in France. And she's one of the first people who was able to do v hit on very young kids using the synapses system. Um, again, I just put here, it's a very nice article to read regarding v hit in children. Um, and then one of the last tests I do is caloric, and I try as much as I can to stay away from calorics with children. Because we know that at two months, uh, the VOR, we, we can get the VOR response. At six months, um, uh, at six months, you start suppressing, the children start suppressing their VOR. Around seven to eight months, more or less, you can get a reliable caloric response. However, keep in mind that no caloric response does not mean an absent caloric at this age. 24 months, the VOR response is mature. You can pro perform a test if really needed, but it's a different procedure that we use. And five to eight years old, you can perform the test depending on personality. TNs should be easy to do more or less. It's like adults, they have their own personality, but five to eight years old, it really depends on how the child is behaving for me to decide if caloric is going to be doable, yes or no. Uh, Sometimes I don't like forcing a child, especially if I'm gonna keep on seeing the child. Um, once they have a bad memory of getting dizzy, which is some kids love, some kids hate. Uh, if they hate it, the, even rehabilitation is going to be ruined with me. So this is why I keep in mind whenever I decide on doing caloric testing, that. It's my last option. I really have to do it. And keep in mind that hyperactive response are possible due to underdeveloped neural inhibition. And I'm talking this is before the age of five, even four. Now, again, this test depends on the goggles fit for recording it. Um, if patient can understand instruction, yes or no, and if they can keep their eyes open. Other techniques is to use frenzel glasses and actually... Um, record eye movement and count and nystagmus, which is a technique that I've seen here happen in France, and I'm not very keen about them because if I'm going to do calorics, I want to see I want to see a recording. Um, there are techniques around it again and do calculation, but I'm not very personally. I'm not very keen about it. Okay, so what are the test adjustments that I've done that to now seems to be valid? I changed the temperature. Uh, I use 32 and 42 instead of uh, 30 and 44. I use cold first, and it's true, it's less robust than warm. However, getting two ears in cold is better than getting no ears or no arms. Um, in case of fear, I reduce the irrigation time to 30 seconds, hopefully getting something better than nothing. Um, some, uh, uh, some, um, Physicians or some um, geologists would prefer water. Uh, in my clinic, in our clinic, sorry, I use uh, air. I prefer it. I think it's less messy. Children are less scared than water. And in case of PE tube, you're on the safe side. Um, go monothermal when and whenever it's possible. And if I'm gonna go with monothermal for um, recording reason, I'll go with warm. If I'm going for monothermal just because the child is not allowed, then as I mentioned, it's going to be hot. Okay, so um, reminder, no caloric response does not imply uh, there is no response. And whenever you're doing the test, I forget to mention this priorly, make sure that you give them a task um, that is age appropriate. So sometimes counting backward is not easy, but naming your classmates or your cousins or um, counting normally could be an easier task for them. Um, regarding the parameter parameter with calorics, I would use the same as an adult um, with a cutoff in our clinic for asymmetry of 20. 
Okay, so this is an interesting study that was published in 2018 um, that by, it's called the Visible Assessment in Pediatric Population by Dante. And, I'll, and I really like what should they have done. They have done, they show us here clearly uh, on different age category, what are the success rate for each test. And as you can see, CVAMP was very easy to perform on kids um, uh, even less than three years old, a very high rate of 94%. You see the 75% here in CVAMP? This is the, the two-year-old toddlers and the three-year-old kids are the hardest to test. They have their personality starting to show and it's not easy to test them. And as you can see, the CVAMP otherwise is the the highest success rate. Now, let's go to OVAMP. And we haven't done, o they, in their study, they didn't do OVAMP in less than three years old. And that's because we need the cooperation of the child looking up. I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure because I haven't read the article in details. Someone just informed me this morning, actually on uh, Friday morning, that um, OVAMP were performed by Chinese on newborns, and I would like to get further details about that. So I would only say that based on studies that I've read, that OVAMP have not been, or they don't do it regularly for less than three years old. And afterward, the success rate is very high um, with OVAMP. Rotary chair should be easy. Again, you have an issue 50% with the two years old, three years old, because they do, they're not very... Um, cooperative, they start crying, they don't want to do the test. This is just the terrible tools, I guess. Now, caloric tests, as you can see, we don't do them before the age of four to five. For me, even five to six is where you can get calorics. You need the child to be able to cooperate properly with you. Um, so caloric is on the side. I left the V-hit here, and um, I'm coming back to it for a reason. V hit with this study and similar to other studies are only again relying on lateral V hit and not verticals. And um, five to five months to one year, they're able to do it. It's fine if they're not using the cat. The, they're using the system with no goggles in here. So keep that in mind. These are the percentages and success rate of um, using the synapsis system and with no goggles. So just keep that in mind. And again, we have the terrible tools. Otherwise, we're fine. And we have another um, gap around four to five years old. And I, uh, these are when kids, uh, especially boys, are over-agitated as well. Um, I've seen the over-agitation even in teenagers and boys that um, around the age of uh, 13 to 15, testing them becomes impossible just because they are uh, hyperactive. This same article also uh, mentioned the causes of unreal, uh, why it's impossible or failure to test the fa failure to provide them these services or these tests. And with VHIT, it's impossible if the child is crying, forget about it, don't do the test. If they blink a lot um, or they, they don't allow you to touch their head. And it happens. There are some kids that don't like you to even touch them. Um, in case the, um, the V hit, you're not able to do the exact number needed by the system, this is where the results are unreliable, but it can give you an idea. However, I will only put it as a not inconclusive. Um, and if the V hit traces are not within normative, in normative the accepted gain in uh, velocity. So keep that in mind. Again, with V hit in children, Study tracing by tracing. Do not rely on what the computer is providing you. Okay. CVAMP and OVAMP, um, although it says here not applicable, but I've seen it where kids will remove the electrode. They will refuse to keep electrodes on their face. They hate scrubbing sometimes. Um, they don't want to cooperate with CVAMP. Rare, but uh, it happens. And um, with CVAMP, I discovered that the best way to do it uh, on children is post ABR. You have them hooked already at just a few extra, few extra electrode, and then we do the CVAMP without their full cooperation if possible. Um, with rotary chair, it's just the rotary chair usually is easier than the rest. They're sitting on mom's lap, they're calmer. Uh, we're using a goggle, so it, the goggle problem comes back. 
unless it's a pediatric version, so um, it's fine. Um, caloric test, their fear, oh my God, caloric testing is really, um, it is an issue with calories because we start by telling the child that you're gonna feel a bit of, um, you're gonna feel a bit of dizziness. And I learned throughout the year never to say the word dizziness. I'm gonna say, you're gonna feel, you're gonna feel weird and not dizzy. Weird is the word I use in French. Okay, this is another article that I really recommend to read for everyone who's going into pediatric. It's called Quantitative Vestibular Function Testing in Pediatric Population. It provides some some of their feedback on how to change um, some of the color, some of the um, pediatric testing. Um, uh, I haven't incorporated in my daily um, clinic their advice, but some of you may find, because I have different systems, so maybe some of you would find it uh, beneficial. Okay, so diagnosis. Uh, plenty of uh, studies have provided us with what is the highest, what could be the possible diagnosis or what are the highest rate of diagnosis. And this is a chart that I really like. It tells, uh, we start by seeing, um, uh, is it vertigo or we're talking about dizziness and if it's associated with hearing loss. Let's start with, let's go with this um, decision tree very fast. If the child comes to us with acute vertigo, no hearing loss, I would look at the age. And if it's, um, if it's less than five years old, then I start thinking about BPV. If there is a headache that is associated with this and um, with anxiety, I'll start thinking about, and with no anxiety, sorry, I'll start thinking about migraine, which is the second reason why kids are actually coming to our clinic. And the highest third reason would be concussion post head trauma. So, um, however, head trauma, I have seen head trauma with no hearing loss. So keep that in mind, okay? Uh, I really like this um, uh, chart. I keep it on my desk sometimes as a review, although I would say, again, case history is very suggestive of what's gonna happen. But um, whenever we have students, we have students at the bachelor level, this could help a lot. Okay, uh, again, what are the per highest percentage? As I said, migraine, B uh, BPV, and by this, I mean benign paroxysm and vertigo. And um, we talked about Meniere, it's really rare. Uh, we, we talked about how it had trauma here again, which is a high percentage. Okay. What are the results to accept, expect, sorry? In head trauma, case history is enough to, success, to, to, to link it. And I think that the physical, um, the physical examination done at the uh, ER is more than enough. Um, assessment I would do here is bedside testing if approved by the, the, by the uh, or the physician, the ER physician. In case of migraine, the case history is gonna help a lot. The rest of the tests are going to come normal. Rarely I will see prolonged latency in VAMP. I've seen it a couple of times, but that is it. And abnormal oculomotor tests, I've seen more than uh, more than once in migraine cases. In case of BV, uh, BVB or benign, the case history is helpful. The bike is going to come in positive. Uh, VAMP is needed for follow-up. I always do VAMP um, for follow-up in case I see a recurrent case. And vestibular neuritis, again, case history is important and I think we usually see these kids in um, emergency rooms. We perform the event to, to give further details um, about which part of the spirit of your nerve or section of the nerve. Okay, regarding the management, okay, you have three parts. You have the treatment of the crisis, which is on the spot. You have treatment of post-crisis symptoms and you have the reassurance. And that can take anywhere from six months up to a couple of years. And the treatment of the crisis, and by this I mean medications that are provided to the kids depending on what is the different medication depending on the vertical crisis. However, I explained to the parents clearly that there are very different cases where in case this happens, head to the ER. And um, if there is any change in speech, sudden changes in vision, the child will say something's wrong with my vision, head injury from a fall post a vestibular problem. And I'm not talking that's as initial. 
um, initial um, symptoms. I mean, that's we're treating the child already. Repeat episode of falling and even like small falls. If they see it more recurrent, I would ask them to get, send me a video and based on this, I'll see if the child is leaning to one side, yes or no. I use a lot of videos with kids. Keep that in mind uh, now with technology, that is a very good uh, way to keep um, keep a track of your ch of children. Continued vomiting if the child faints. And finally, if the vertigo is affecting the child from normal day. I'm not talking about VN cases, I'm talking we already treated the child and still the child is so vertiginous that he, he refuses to leave his butt. These are the cases where I say, just bring the child back to ER, let's make sure what's, or let's see how we can help them better. Okay, I also provide prevention list, and by this I mean, um, I don't want them to take the, to um, drive their bikes, play with their car, bike or mini car. And this is similar to when we say to the, to the adult, to not um, use machines. So this is the same system. Um, I would refuse or I would suggest no climbing, no hiking. Um, walks in the parks are a question unless the, it's a stable, uh, there is no ups and downs. It's not a full hiking, it's just like walking straight. I'm fine with that. It's gonna be minimal, but uh, sometimes kids need to go out. Um, I would recommend stay away from swings, etc., during the period where we're being treated for at least one week. And whenever the child feels that uh, symptoms are worsening by movement, I would ask them to stay home and slowly change position. And I'll teach them how to slowly change position. Um, you'll be surprised how fast kids will learn how to adapt to their vertigo but it's a scary moment for them, so we need to um, help them with that as much as possible. Okay, how to deal with uh, vestibular disorder in children? And there are different ways of doing this, but I'll start with vestibular rehabilitation therapy. And vestibular rehabilitation therapy, we can do it ourselves as audiologists to some extent, or we can send to the vestibular uh, therapist. I prefer to use, uh, to provide exercises that are simple exercises at home once I see the child is, is capable of doing this. And um, uh, like um, reading a book while walking, it could be going to the park and we have different targets. Uh, these are customizable for every group of children and I think hopefully I'm, I'm going to be soon provide, be giving a lecture about the civil adaptation in children and um, we'll, we'll post it online hopefully soon. Surgical intervention. Now, surgical intervention comes with positive and negatives. And I really, really, I underline this a million times. Explain to the child, to the parents, I don't know, to the guardian. Make sure that they understand that whenever we're doing surgical intervention, sometimes things are going to be affected for the entire, for the entire life, especially in in cases of Meniere or even in, for example, cochlear implant with a child with vestibular, vestibular deficit bilaterally, you need to explain the entire situation to the parents and get their feedback and make sure that they are ready to go through the, the intensive vestibular rehabilitation, audiological, audiological follow-up that we're gonna have. And some people just believe that surgery is gonna solve everything and we need to make sure that their expectation is well um, maintained. Medication, they're giving the similar suppressants, steroid, antiviral, antibiotic. A lot of groups of medication is given based on the cases. We do canary positioning in case of BPV and BPV. Dietary consideration is given to everyone in our cases where we're similar to migraine and malaria diseases. We are providing um, constraints on, um, on dietary um, input on all children, even the VN children. We feel that it, yeah, it provides um, a better uh, prognosis at the end or a better um, recovery time. And once we feel everything is fine, we allow the kids to go back to eating chocolate because sometimes after this problem, they refuse to stop eating chocolate, although we explain it's a very short period of time for the end. Um, I will only talk about, uh, just go through migraine a bit. 
because we uh, this is what we're trying to do with migraine kids and many our children. We're doing something very similar. Medication, um, different hospitals or different schools have their different combination of um, uh, medication, but we're also giving um, tripton, which is the nasal spray for above the age of 10 years old. Uh, we're sending them to ophthalmo to make sure that we are um, correcting their uh, vision problem and we're sending them to orthopedically at education. Um, it, um, I'm not sure if the term is very familiar. It's similar to occupational health with some physical therapy orientation. We make sure that they keep a journal for sleep and headaches with smiley faces and stars. And again, as we mentioned on Friday, and I was very happy that uh, Dr. Alfarvar mentioned it, no overstimulation, no TV, noisy, no noisy environment, try to decrease this, and hopefully this helps a lot. Okay, I'm just gonna thank everyone for attending the three lectures. Um, I have a ton of reference, I'm not gonna go through them, but um, I, ha I would just like to leave the floor for any questions hopefully and um thank you for attending this morning i know it's very early uh, thank you very much uh, dr solara for your uh, uh, very interesting presentation and uh, thanks for sharing your uh, expertise just i have uh, three questions so the first question uh, what's your experience of doing caloric test in the presence of otitis media with effusion? Okay, so uh, in case of otitis media, I will wait for it to resolve unless it is we're doing the t uh, we're doing the test prior to PE tubes, and the, the physician is um, the surgeon is um, doubting a possibility of severe problem prior to surgery. That's the only time where I will do it with otitis media, and this is why I will use. So, um, what always you get? What's your like uh, real experience of caloric responses in presence of otitis media? They give mm -hmm. a, a more robust response, or always a less robust, uh, robust response than the uh, other normal children without otitis media with effusion. Well, I would honestly say it depends on the child and how recurrent the otitis media is. I have seen kids with no responses at all, mm. and I have the majority of them were were absent or it would be reduced. There are two cases, however, that I remember very well where they're hyperactive. But again, remember, otitis media, the, the population we're having are very young children. And our way of um, um, collecting these data are, is not very accurate. So again, my personal experience would be a reduced, but is it reduced because of the OME or is it reduced because of the way we're doing the test on these children? Remember, we're doing these tests on age two to three years old, where it's very hard to actually keep the eyes open and we're counting the nystagmus. Uh, thank you. So the second question is, <clears throat> how, many, how, um, how many sweeps you do with uh, cervical uh, VIMP? In the children, how many sweeps do you get? Okay, uh, here's here's my personal. Um, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be sending. Um, what what's what system are the you sweeps, using? The number of sweeps, like the repetition of the test, like 100, 250. Yes, but uh, my question is, what system are you using? Well, no, with any system, it doesn't matter. Okay, because we're using an amplifier. That's why I'm saying. No, no, I'm talking about the number of sweeps, which means the number of uh, recorded traces yes. you get. In C vamps. Yes, in C vamps. Yes. Uh, okay. So uh, if you give me a second, I will put it on the screen. Our uh, uh, just a second. I hopefully have, I, I use a hundred, hundred can be used, but just a second. I think I have here my uh, recommendation for uh, CVAMP, which I wanted to share with your group for sure. uh, sweeps um, in, in pediatrics. Please do. 
And not only, uh, uh, like for me, I will use 200 sweeps, but again, it depends on which type of, I have two machines, but usually it will be 200 sweeps that we collect. That's really and too we much. Like even Sorry? in adults, 200 sweeps, very exhausting and too much. And uh, I do believe it's not needed at all. Even with 50 to 100, you get the very nice responses. That's why I wanted to ask you. It's very hard to keep the child uh, to take uh, 200 sweeps with a rate of three to five uh, uh, stimuli per second. That's take more time and it's very exhausting because you have to keep the neck little um, uh, to the side. Yes, but it dip, it, okay. So if do you, you stop? Let's do you stop back. when you get a good response, or you complete the two hundred sweeps? Okay. Can you, I'm gonna just ask to repeat um, what you're saying because I'm not able to hear properly. Okay. Two hundred sweeps with the neck to, uh, deviated to the side, contracted the muscle. Uh, with a slow rate stimulus, uh, usually three to five yes. stimuli per second. That uh, takes more time and it's very exhausting. Even for adult, uh, for adult subject, if you keep just asking him to keep the neck uh, um, deviated to, or rotated to one side and to wait for that time, it's exhausted. And it's not required because CVM uh, does not need averaging. It's always a very robust and good response, even with uh, like 50 uh, sweeps. Uh, okay. You, you, you're, what are you doing? You're going with as, as a lower sweep with like 20? Yeah, yeah. For me, I never go beyond 100. How much? I never go beyond 100 sweeps for CVIMP. Okay, but you're using air conduction, right? Yes. Oh, okay. okay. So uh, just as a last question, sorry. Because everybody were reading the text books about the paroxysmal uh, vertigo for childhood as one of mm -hmm. the most common causes, and they, it's always written in the books. In clinical mm -hmm. practice, I see pediatric population, that's really a very rare condition. And uh, most of them, they are straightforward cases of migraine. So do you have, you put in your uh, slides that you have some cases of paroxysmal vertigo for childhood. So what's really your clinical experience? What okay. kind this of presentation? Why. What kind of finding? Okay, this is why if you notice, I said that whenever I, I, disc I feel a, a possibility of PPP, I do VAMP as well. And the reason why I do VAMP is because I know that I, it's not written in the literature, but personally I've seen it where these kids will end up having migraine or many air cases. I, haven't, I have seen it in adults, but I haven't seen it in children in many air cases. But uh, what's, why am I saying this? I do believe that they are all interconnected and goes back to the question uh, of diagnosis. Whenever I have a BPV case, I know that the Dixol Pike and uh, maneuvering is enough, but I keep a list of uh, ocular motor testing and VAMP with me, and I'm going to follow up this chart. But I do, I but, do agree with you that. Baroxysmal uh, um, vertigo for childhood is different than the benign baroxysmal vertigo. That's a different category. That's a different Can disease. you repeat that? Okay, then I misunderstood what you said. Can you repeat what you said? You put some slides for, uh, I don't know, you call it uh, a BBV. So this uh, benign uh, paroxysmal vertigo for childhood is something different than the benign paroxysmal positional vertigo or the BBV. Yes, but both cases and my, the benign paroxysmal vertigo BP, BVP and BPPV, both of them, both of them, in my personal opinion, will will I will need for them to perform a VAMP and ocular motor testing. And and this is what your question is: Do I see them later on becoming migraine patient? No, no. My question exactly: If you have seen finding, like what kind of nystagmus you see, what kind of clinical presentation usually they present, how the parents. Uh, inform you about the problem of their child. Why, what's going okay. on? I need it from clinical, from real experience, because that's a very rare condition in our experience. Uh, it is rare in our case as well, and we usually see it 
we we usually um, it would be an acute vertigo with an nystagmus usually horizontal based on my personal experience. Um, the child would would not would com uh, would complain of. Um, um, usually the child is less than, it's, it's a younger population. There is no hearing loss movement that is um, affecting him. The, the, the vertigo is acute and not tolerable. This is how I, I see it. Um, the performing tests, they will have an abnormal, in some cases, abnormal uh, uh, Fukuda test, if I can do perform Fukuda on them. And I have seen um i would say no i i can't i can't remember the ocular motor test being abnormal at the beginning but mainly the nystagmus uh okay with these children what do, what do we do with these children mainly uh what what give them what gives them away is their acute uh, vertigo and what gives them away as well in um in this younger group um uh, would be their um, their nystagmus, and it would be as well um, their recurrency. It's a few seconds. It's the case yeah. history that provides versed information yes. about this. Dr. Salar, one last question. The bone conduction sure. VEMP, the bone conduction VEMP, which company bone yeah. conduction do you use? Because we are okay. not getting uh, the bone conduction VEMPs uh, uh, so commonly. So which, uh, which company makes the bone conduction okay. VEMP? Okay. Uh, what we are using is uh, we're getting uh, we work a lot with skull vibration induced nystagmus. Okay. So we have our own system that is amplified. We use it's not a B seventy one. Okay. It's a B eighty one with an amplifier. B eighty one bone amplifier. With an amplifier. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us and thanks for all the inputs that you gave and uh, enhancing our uh, knowledge in the last three right. days. I want to say one more thing that uh, hopefully I can answer Dr. Al Farghal about this, the question he asked me. Okay. Um, when we're talking about uh, benign paroxysmal vertigo with children, um, one thing that is a, that comes to my mind is that um, can case history differentiate between um, b between BPV and um, BPV and uh, other cases and. Not I will say yes. And it's the case history seriously that could provide us with more than the actual diagnostic test that would provide us with feedback and the age group for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, one more thing I would like to ask if it's possible. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, yeah. the cases in pediatrics yeah. are in a rise, but they are still rare. So, uh, whenever you decide that you're going to go into pediatric testing, do not assume that you're going to see pediatrics all the time, which makes it really, I would say I would see um, five to six kids every week. And sometimes the feedback from other colleagues that work in pediatrics is very important. This is why I think um, conferences like these provide us with experiences from people who not all, like our number of patients that we see is five to six per week sometimes people will tell me you're seeing more than we see in our clinics but remember we're a very group a very small group of um, audiologists that are actually working in vestibular assessment in children so the feedback from everyone would be very very helpful and uh, I would like if possible if we still have a minute just to say see if anyone has an experience with a special case or um, an interesting case and share it. And um, this is something that I really, really hope we can do. Use your Dr. Falgar, your uh, your uh, Facebook group for that because um, hmm. it's. Um, I, ca I can only say that we. I'm sure everyone has the same situation where we go here and it's rare we can find someone to actually ask the question that we have in pediatric cases because they're so diverse. They are so unique. Rarely that you're going to get a typical textbook um, case of vertical in children. Hope um, I would, again, I would end this conversation by thanking everyone for coming. I know it's very early. Thank you so yeah, much. And I will, use, um, I will use the group today to post the sweeps for Dr. <laughs> one, one last question, Solana. Sure, go ahead. 
uh, what are the clinical conditions you commonly diagnose in different age groups, say like below three years, between three to eight years, and eight year onwards? Okay, can you please, sorry, repeat the question? I apologize. Uh, what, what are the clinical conditions you diagnose between different age groups, say like below three years, between three to eight years, and eight year onwards? Okay. Um, I'm going to I'm going to say the following um, under the age okay, it depends why they're coming in the, the first place, because the bulk of our kids that we see under the age of five years old or four years old are cases mainly of uh, sudden hearing. Sorry, for um, sensory neural hearing loss accompanied the vestibular deficit and um, cases very rarely cases of VN or otitis media accompanied with vestibular loss. It's not until the age of five that I start seeing, um, I start seeing more of um, um, cases of um, migraine or cases of um, uh, BPPV, and I think it's related to the child being able to report this uh, this uh, problem and not about uh, how often the, the the epidemiology of the actual uh, um, disorder. Um, the mean ages again will increase with the cap capacity of the child to explain further their uh, symptoms. I hope this helped you understand what I'm trying to say, um, or it answers your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, what I'm trying to say again, the kids that are under the age of five usually come to our clinic for um, vestibular assessment prior and post cochlear implant and because of sensory neural hearing loss. The rest and where we see more of the diagnosis are because of them complaining of dizziness and coming to us or forwarded from the physician. And usually these are the migraineous patient, et cetera, that they have reached an age that is, um, they're capable of explaining their, uh, their uh, dizziness. So it's not, it's not based on, to be very honest, I don't think I can say that it's age specific. It's more of the child's capacity to explain what's going on. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Solara. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, it was great having you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Solara. All Thank the best. You. Thank you.